So Tracy is an occupational therapist and a dementia educator. So she runs the Walking in Another Shoes program for home-based supporters in Waitaha, Canterbury. And Tracy is an amazing mix of passion and practicality. And I think you're going to be able to see that in the conversation today. So I think, Tracy, when we're thinking about the how, one of the things that I think we sometimes say to ourselves is kind of, keep it simple, stupid, isn't it? I was waiting for you to unmute me. <laughs> Apologies for that. Um, I just want to say that um, before I talk about being simple, aren't diversional therapists, recreational therapists so inventive? I was watching some of those clips and just thinking, where do people get these creative ideas? And I quite liked the one where you saw a slipper coming flying at the camera. I thought that was quite intriguing. Um, but also, um, happy uh, Diversional Therapy, Recreational Therapy um, Awareness Week. Well done, people. Um, we certainly need you in the team. So yes, as an occupational therapist, I probably am going to talk about activity. Um, I will also, it, for me, it's about what purpose it holds for that person, what meaning it holds for that individual. Um, so sometimes uh, an activity of daily living can be incredibly meaningful for that individual. It just depends on how it's presented and what it means to that individual. So um, that's kind of the concept of how I'm going to talk about activity today. So Susan, you're right. When we want to keep things simple, I think one of the first things we want to be thinking about is when we're presenting an activity or we're engaging with that person in an activity is how is that environment supporting the person to be able to focus and to engage. So a lot of the times we actually need to be thinking about the activity, uh, the environment, sorry, or the setting and how that helps that person. And I really like that concept of make visible the things that we want a person to engage with visible and make the things that we don't need that person to be engaging with less visible. So we want those things to, to kind of stand out for us. So I am a big one about thinking about clearing that space and just having that thing that they're needing to engage with present for them. Um, I guess what that does as well is it enhances the orientation to why a person is actually there in that space and what they're actually going to be engaging with versus worrying about anything else that might be around them. And I think we do that too, although you might not think that when you look at my office, it's an absolute chaotic mess. Um, however, at times I am inclined to clear the space that I can focus as well. So that's one of the things that I uh, that I think about. So we also think about the vision. So for people that are living particularly with a, a, a dementia process or are aged like myself, I've got um, glasses, I my vision is impaired. Um, we need to make sure that things are presented to that person within a reasonable visual field as well. Um, and then that goes with good lighting. So making sure, again, think about that environment. How does that enhance the space and the activity for that individual? So an example for that is we've got a chap on the ward that we're working with at the moment. And for him, making breakfast was always a key job for him to be able to do at home. So he's wanting to get back into doing that. So we had him on the ward using a shared kitchen space. And for him, he's just becoming quite overwhelmed and it's difficult for him to be able to isolate the items that he's requiring. The noise of staff and other people coming in and interrupting him is impairing as well. And he's feeling watched because there's so many people in that space. So today, the, um, the lovely assistant is actually going to set up an entirely different area for us with a bench space, with a kettle, a toaster, um, some basic bread. We're also going to be using containers, jars that make sense to that person instead of the little hospital or aeroplane kind of fidgets that we get. He can't manipulate those. He doesn't recognize those. So we're going to be bringing in the, the normal jars of the um, spreads of his choice, the normal bottle of margarine or butter of what he uses. So that it's all making sense and orientating him to the activity. But he's also not going to have the pressure or the interruptions of the people around him. 
So that's kind of setting up the environment for that person. And I guess when you think about some of the games that the people were playing in that last clip that Orkidia showed us, which were amazing, that scene was kind of set up because they were in a lovely circle or a half circle, and it was pretty obvious what they were actually going to be focusing on. So again, they'll set up that environment to help people focus and be aware of why am I here today? What am I actually doing? Which is really hard, uh, really important, I think. Does that make sense? Yes, Susan? Yes, nice, good. Okay. Um, I guess the other thing is, is that we want to simplify the activity for the individual. So um, how do we how do we determine what are the bits that, and like Okedia said, the strengths, what are the strengths that this person's actually got? What are the parts of the activity that they can actually engage in and make sure that we're reducing the steps down so that it's not overwhelming? So for example, we wouldn't expect someone necessarily to go to a wardrobe and to be able to pick out the right garment for that day, understanding what the weather is, understanding what the social event is. If I can't recall all of that, then that's going to make it really complex for me. So I might reduce that down to maybe a couple of choices or an area where they get to choose from versus that whole big area and environment. If we've got someone that is having difficulty itemizing, so they might determine, you might find someone that's got six pairs of trousers on and they've forgotten their underpants. So you might actually help them by um, pre-picking for them if they're okay with that. So they've got again one set of each thing and then putting it into order for them so that they when they take the thing up on the thing that's on top that's the thing that goes on first so it's just thinking about how do we support that person break that task down to enable them to do at least a part of that and even if it's just the pulling the trousers up even if it's just putting an arm in it's about allowing that person to be engaged and participating in that activity with them just checking my notes uh, sometimes when I think about the breaking of an activity down, it might be simply how we instruct a person, and that might be we model it for that person. So they might not um, be able to understand put the shirt on, but we might be able to go like that, and it shows that person that we're popping their jersey on. So it's just figuring out how we're actually going to, to tweak that down. We want to make sure that we allow as much as possible reasonable time. If we're actually wanting that person to engage in some part in that activity, then we need to make sure that we've got a bit of time. So I know people say to me, we don't have a lot of time to support that person to get dressed. Well, you know, that's okay because we have to be realistic. Um, sorry, I just wasn't quite sure what that said on the screen. Oh, and I can see myself. Um. We want to make sure that maybe what they don't do is they don't have to dress their whole body, but they might really enjoy being, being able to put their shoes on. And that's the part or the component that you're focusing on for that individual. So it's just making sure that we allow some space to, to let that person be a part of that process. Um, look, a lot of the things we want to do is we want to consider what is the expected outcome. So instead of having an activity, for example, a game um, like a banana grams game, we may not expect that the person's going to be able to do it perfectly and follow the rules. That's not something that we need to. We need to think about what are the standards for this person? What is it that we're actually wanting? What do they want to get from it? And like Okedia said, it's about engagement. So what does that look like for that person? Are they in their corner snoring? Well, that's probably not engaging. But if they're there just watching you, that could be passive engagement. And that's engagement in itself. Or they might be quite intently peering at what you're doing. Or they might be reaching out to be a part of that. They may, instead of being able to spell a whole word, a word, sorry, they might copy what you've done. Or they might just be able to pick all the, the letter Bs out. Or they might be able to, if you said to them, oh, have you had any pets in the past? And they go, oh, I've had a dog. They might be able to spell the word dog. So it's just being able to determine what is it that that person can do from that activity? My best part is actually to see if someone's quite helpful and they might want to pack it all away from me. <laughs> That's always a bonus. 
So um, it just depends on how you present it and what are the actual components of that activity that that person wants to be engaged with. It might be because we're thinking about infection control these days. We can throw all of these bits. If you haven't seen banana grams, they're fantastic. They're like scribble. But we can throw all these bits into a wash basin with soapy water and some people just love the feel of actually squishing them around and getting them clean. And that is a fantastic opportunity for that person if that's what they enjoy. Um, the other one we wanted to look at is how do we enhance participation? So how do we keep that person focused? What is it that we need to do to enable them to be present and to stay present? And it might be just the things that we do to keep that person with us. And it might be just when they go to wander off, we might encourage them with a bit of touch. Um, Orkedia mentioned about the, the hugging and a lot of people we can just get their attention by giving them a gentle touch and it might bring their focus back down. We might be able to start shifting a few pieces or handing them a piece of something that we're doing like if we're doing a jigsaw puzzle we can hand them a piece or if we're doing um, some baking we hand them a cup or we hand them a spoon and they can be part of that. So it's just helping them move on to that next piece of the activity that we're wanting to do instead of um, finishing right at that point because they may not realize that there's another couple of steps to go. So it's just how do we prompt that person to be able to continue that engagement for them. The other thing that we want to be doing is thinking about our our language and, and the communication that we're using that actually got that is encouraging that person to keep going at it. Gosh, that looks really pretty. I love the way that you're doing that. But I know that you do do this, but just a reminder that we want to make sure that we are using adult language. I do occasionally see people using language that's a little bit childlike as such, and that can actually turn some people off from doing that. So it's just making sure that we use that. Gosh, that's amazing. I love the way that you're doing that versus, oh, that's just gorgeous, um, which is probably how I would talk to my dog, but maybe because um, I love my dog, but... Um, we wouldn't necessarily do that with the people that we're supporting. So it is just about how do we encourage that engagement that we're doing with the nodding and the smile, the participating, join in and do what actually is required for that person to stay there. Um, I, the other thing is, is that what we do want to do is we want to make sure that we're monitoring for frustration. So if the person has um, either lost interest, then we want to maybe introduce something different. If the person is struggling with a component, I mean, I'm an occupational therapist, so I'm all for people giving it a go. But if you can start to see that level of frustration, then it's actually important that you leap in and give them a bit of a hand or tweak it for them so that they can actually do it. So, you know, if they're trying to put their shoes on then three times and then their frustration level might be a little bit too much. So give, give the shoe a bit of a hoik and help them on with it. Um, and again, it comes down to choosing the time of the day that's best for that person, not best for us. So when is that person going to be at their best? That chap that's on the ward that's making breakfast. Um, luckily, it is breakfast that he wants to make because once he hits lunchtime, his brain is so tired that that's not a good for, time for us to be thinking about focusing on any activities for him. So he becomes more in a sensory space at that point. Um, what else can we use? And the other thing, I think a big thing is um, Susan and the team is thinking about strategies for yourself. When we're trying to introduce activities for people, be okay with it. Be relaxed. It doesn't always work and the person may not want to engage. And that is cool as well. So it is about how do you look after yourself? So be really proud that you're giving things a go try anything and I'm certainly somebody that will try things like we've got some very colorful beads um, and I might just chuck some things in on the table or hand them to a person and then I'm observing to see what it is that they're actually doing with them and are they interested in that item that we're giving them but I'm not kind of pressurizing myself that there needs to be a set target for that person because if we're pressured then how can we truly be present with that person? And I think that that's uh, a massive component of when you're trying to engage somebody in a um, an activity is being really present with that person. So be kind of relaxed, take some deep breaths for yourself, enjoy it yourself because you can sell it by actually just enjoying it um, and reminding yourself that you're doing an amazing job and um, you are there to enhance people 
with the activities that they're doing. So you are our biggest tool that we've got, if you know what I mean. So the other thing I want to show you is um, what we've got is a sensory sleeve here. So there's a few bits and bobs. Something like this is going to be for the person, um, for a person that's actually more of a sensory mode. So we've got someone at the moment that's going around picking and plucking things or scratching themselves. And so we can use a sensory sleeve that actually just allows that person to actually have something to pick and pluck, but that's actually not causing them any sensory or skin discomfort or harm, but it's actually giving them something that's nice and bright um, and something to touch and feel and engage with versus maybe just trying to find something. As human beings, we're not designed to not have stimulation, if, if you know what I mean. So that's why they use kind of white environments for torture, where they put people into a space and there's absolutely no stimulation. So our brains are not designed to do that. That's when you start to find people having interesting reactions and responses around. And that's because they are seeking sensory input. So it really does depend on what you've got around to support that person. Um, anything will actually engage. Susan says to me, utilize the, the movements that that person is actually doing. And I was talking to some family members the other day and I said, you know how some people, you know, if they've got that ability where they're just using repetitive movements, then maybe change that up into an activity. So for example, if someone's normally been an outdoorsy crafty kind of person or a woods person, then maybe getting them to do some sanding, maybe getting them to polish some shoes, but using that repetitive action that that person's doing. And the family said, oh my God, yes, because he sits there and he just constantly does this on the chair. So what he's doing is he's actually giving himself some sensory input and the family are now thinking about how they can use that movement but give him an actual thing and a purposeful activity to do so thank you Susan that was very useful uh I think that oh I think that's about me Susan anything else were you going to say anything more about um I, th I think that you've talked a little bit about using strengths but about finding out about the things that um have been lifelong interests and adapting them so I guess that's thinking about like Akedia was talking about. It was very good having you there, Akedia. Um, and it is about understanding who that person is beforehand. Um, so what were their interests beforehand and how to tweak that? I guess, um, Susan, we, we talked about the pillars of health. Mm -hmm. And that's a nice way for me to think about it. So we've got the six pillars of health. If one of the, one of the ones is eat smart, and I guess if we've got somebody that used to be a baker or a cooker, uh, cook, yeah, a, someone that did a lot of cooking or baking in the um, house, you can adapt that by. Um, it doesn't really matter how much a person can or is, you know, is, is needing support with. So we can start with a person following a really basic recipe. They can be just part of the preparation for the food, um, right down to the point of actually being able to just look through recipe books is actually really useful. So you can kind of tweak the parts that a person's actually engaged in, knowing that if you are someone that's enjoyed being around food, then we can still engage that person within that process. Um, and I'm I'm someone that says, you know, if, as particularly if we're wanting to encourage appetites, because we do know that sometimes um, the appetite can decrease and diminish for people. But when I think about some of the spaces that people in, if they're not engaged with any kind of meal prep, they're not getting any of that preparatory work. So it's really nice to use the, the cookbooks or the, the magazines to actually help that person be engaged, get them washing potatoes, get them peeling potatoes, get them, you know, part of that baking, stirring, whatever it is that they're actually able to do, that they can still be a component or be part of that process. That what you were asking Susan <laughs> that's yeah. great cool and then when we think about like I'm such a moving person like I really am someone that needs to move I have to move so if I go into a rest home facility and if I do get dementia I'm going to be that person that will be moving furniture around the place because I know for myself I need lots of heavy load 
So for me, I you're going to have to get out there and do some physical stuff for me. Give me a wheelbarrow to push. Give me um, even a balloon bashing. You know, it doesn't actually matter. I know that um, I went into a rest home space the other day because I ad adopted a chap and he um, they were putting up the exercise group and I thought, oh, you guys haven't adapted this quite well enough for this group because there was this like 30 people sitting in a semicircle watching a a clip on the TV which half of them couldn't actually see and they were wanting them to do different movements and very few people were actually getting engaged so I just naughtily grabbed balloons and a couple of balls and we threw it around the group and then people were coming full on out there with lots of activity and I was getting pelted by some people that had been in some pretty decent netball teams um, that no one actually knew about but so they got really engaged and people were kicking when they're in the wheelchair and bashing it and passing it so again it's just about adapting but getting lots and lots of movement I guess one of the things that we were wondering about was about communicating effectively how we can communicate well with people to help them to engage Do you know and again I think it's that keeping things simple if required I have probably talked quite fast today and that's something that I'm inclined to do but if I am working alongside somebody I can slow it right down and so it is making sure that we talk at a level that that person's brain is able to process so bringing a lot of the words that are unnecessary and decluttering them away in our conversation making sure we've got that person's attention however we do that through um, our verbal communication our touch communication we might want to use the actual context um, so we're going to play with some have you seen this banana grams and pull out the items um, keep that just keeping things simple sometimes I'm inclined to actually just zip and not communicate through my verbal at all because that can be distracting so I might be more inclined just to point to things or to have a smile or to gesture a lot more than I think necessarily talking it can be overrated occasionally fantastic now, um, we have, Orkidia, would it be all right if we brought you in for some questions as well? Because we do have some people coming in with questions. So would that, would that be all right? Yeah, if we yeah, you I, back I, in? That'd be I, lovely. I'm in the That'd background hiding, but I, but I am here. Um, Yay. So one of the questions that we've got coming up is just a question about um, helping someone to orientate to time and there is a clock on the wall and it's it's um, a black and white clock but how we can help someone to orientate to time and I think they're particularly wondering about you know being ready for meals yeah I follow yeah. through the questions so one of the things that I I believe we all need to keep in mind is that it really depends on the person yeah. and um we really shouldn't have a blanket approach. However, we can enhance by creating a routine that is gonna be working for that person. Um, Carolyn, which is also on the call, and she is a director for, I believe, uh, Education Learning Alzheimer's in Zealand, um, is right on the comment that she's making. It also has to do with the smell, if the person still has active, the sense of a smell, obviously. Um, when people are talking about the timing of the day, there are technologies available, but we also need to consider, is this actually going to be appropriate for the person? In my own personal experience, what uh, we have done with my Nana is we got um, a clock that actually says the time. So we're able to set up the time of the day, for example, um, she normally wakes up at 5 a.m. It's something that she has done all her life. So we have an alarm that it will go off at 5 a.m. And she was actually used, she, she used to live in a farm. So uh, we set up a rooster sound. So, you know, when you get the cuckoo, um, then she, she knows and she wakes up. When it's launch time, um, my brother set up a song, which is um, a Spanish song. Um, and then she knows that's launch time. 
and the same for going for going to to sleep. Um, there was a TV show where he managed to get the clip and he put the uh, the little bit of the song in the in the alarm setting, and it just plays. So she kind of knows, oh, that's time to go to bed. So I think we we really have to be smart on how we are personalizing things. A lot of the time, it has to be with the approach of people. So if you are a family member, if you are a care staff, it's not necessarily about its launch time, but it's about how are we inviting that person to participate in what's coming. So it might be launch, but maybe if I support the person to walk past where they can smell the food, where we're actually inviting them, hey, have you ever tried this meal? Uh, we can actually make it a dining experience on daily basis. So I think that would be my um, my advice based on my personal and uh, professional experiences. Beautiful. I, I think that it fits in beautifully with that concept of how do you set up the environment to help prepare that person. And you're right. It's about the sounds and the smells and the cues and the people and the invites and the way that you set it up. And of course, that's going to be different depending if they're in a shared space or in an independent mm -hmm. space. But I love that concept. I've always thought about um, shared spaces. If you could just have a bread maker or a, a slow cooker that kind of has those smells just wafting that helps to cue people. And it's kind of like that whole... You know, if no one wants to eat toast, but by crikey, everybody smells toast and you start getting hungry, you know, you, you might not even want to eat it, but it just reminds you food is coming. And I know that one group that we had in one of the rest home spaces, they actually had a bit of a game that they played only about 15 minutes before lunchtime. And it was just they'd throw a ball and say, and they'd bring up a, a theme like pies and what was your favorite flavor of pie and what, you know, and everybody would went around the room and they came up with these, but it's just that concept of thinking and talking food is useful, but um, you're right. If someone's independently at home, I love that concept of the, um, the rooster and the song, anything that cues that person in, or even if it's a, a prayer or, you know, whatever tell, whatever ritual that person is used to having that is a reminder of, oh, oh, this is what that event, it's about the, how do we use the environment to orientate the person to what's actually happening around them? And I love your idea, Okiria, of it's about that invite, you know, how do we also invite that person to be part of that process? Mm. That is a fantastic, so much in there. Now, one of the things that is um, coming up, Carolyn, you've got a couple of comments that you're, you've been making in the chat and I was wondering if you'd like to just come in I, this, this most intriguing thing has come in from Carolyn Bartle saying an ode to eating so Carolyn would you would you like to just um come and ode to us. us come an ode to us come, come an ode to us indeed hello everybody hi <laughs> <laughs> now um it won the dementia design awards about I don't know six or seven years ago I'm not sure how accessible it is, but I used to cart it around on my training events with me and you put different food smells in there. And obviously it tells the brain that it's time to eat because normally there's this process that happens before we eat. And so it really improves appetite. I'm not sure how it's, if it's available in New Zealand, but I thought it was a really good idea at the time. And the other thing I've just discovered recently by accident is I was looking at some research from way back where they were using songs to help tap into people's procedural memory to help them to remember to do specific activities. And I sent a poem to my brother through my family chat and he sent it back to me as a song. I was so impressed. So there's a technology now that you can use to create songs. So I thought it wouldn't it be great if we could try this to help people to remember to do things, to remember to, to take their medication. I don't know, maybe it's worth a try because it's something that's accessible. Yeah. Oh, Carolyn, you always come in with just something new and amazing. <laughs> I do, I have read somewhere that orange, orange essence or lemon, that citrusy, because what, um, if you, if like a kid, you said, if, if you've got the sense of smell, um, 
if you if you yourself just peel an orange or a lemon and smell it your mouth will start to water and it's sort of that preparatory work for um for wanting to eat so it's a nice way to um to think about food so we tried using um orange essence in water as a pre-lunch thing and people were using um, warmed up flannels that had been dipped into this to wash face and hands which was a nice refresher for moving in so that was a hygiene thing as well as a, a smell and sensory process. Mm, that's fantastic. Now um, also in the comments there's a wee bit of a conversation going on and I think sparked very much Orchidia by the way that you brought in the the role of culture as being so much of someone's identity and a very powerful thing to be bringing in when we're thinking about what makes things meaningful and there's a bit of a conversation going on and I know we have a couple of people here from Aki Hyoho and a Pacifica provider a very yes. rare and precious thing mm -hmm. and um, I was just wondering if they'd like to come in and say something about um some of what they're finding about um working with bringing in the the culture when yes. they're working in this area definitely i think that was uh was it you Tuakoi? i think we might have Haya and rufa maybe yeah uh, yes, I'll give the opportunity. Uh, kia ora tato. Mm -hmm. I'll give the opportunity to um, Akiuho, um uh, representative here, in order to respond before um, I make a comment. <laughs> Takoi, are you here? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot, but we've just had such lovely comments in there. I thought, well, you might like to just share. <laughs> Sorry, I just thought it would help at the moment. Um, I think I've been talking. Um, on behalf of the Akiuho, I'd let our, our team is all in here, so I'll let them pitch in when they want. But uh, basically, we're um, dementia navigators. So we just started a year ago. Um, our job is to uh, be able to contact our people, so we're Tongans. And our job is to be able to obtain the people that have not been diagnosed with dementia and be able to act as advocates and navigators to lead them through the process of being able to be diagnosed with dementia if they are actually if they're actually storing um signs and symptoms of dementia. So that's basically what our job is, and we're planning to be able to widen out to the other um, Pacific um, cultures like Samoan, Fijians, and so on and so forth. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, Tua Koi, did you have anything that you wanted to add? I can see you hovering. <laughs> I think Paya um, have touch a lot of 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 our services um um we it is a pilot scheme so um but according to tefatura stats there is 500 plus pacific island people undiagnosed every year and um and it's growing um that number grows every year uh hence the reason we are here yeah and would you, know? would you say would you say that you have anything to say about that the idea that you know being meaningful being able to tap into your own culture is a very special thing to be able to do as people progress in, with dementia absolutely and and there are barriers um for instance um stigmatization you know uh, um that we come across and we're trying uh so hard vigorously to 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 uh drop the wall down and 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 openly talk about it um and we are still um so you're new to the to to the battlefield, may I may I may I say? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And I, I see 
Rufo, you have your hand up. Uh, yes, thank you, Susan. Um, I have to acknowledge Akiuho for the uh, the work that they do, although it's a pilot, but um, they're doing a good job in order to support um, our population of Hotong and older people in um, in Auckland. Um, they have done a lot of work uh, for the Tongan community as a pilot, and according to their plan, they're going to do the uh, the same to apply to other cultures as well. But what I was just um, talking about, just my question because I know it's over 60% of our older people population living in Auckland um, for mainstreams. I know the culture, the language, it's quite effective to our whānau Pacifica. Um, and that's another effective activity that helps a lot with people with dementia. So um, I was just uh, suggesting some ways. I know that there's, uh, there are people who uh, prefer to be transferred to the mainstreams, um, like um, uh, your organization in order to be cared for. And in, in, in terms of supporting them with some activities, the culture is really important in the language because the language can be able to have some sort of uh, games, you know, that the dominoes or, you know, the bingo games, all those little things that works. In the in the mother tongue that can add it on to, and also with the the it's just a, the reminder of uh, reading the Bible verses because that's part of the upbringing. Uh, little things that the quotes from the Bible in their language that really matters. So I that was my uh, comments that I put on the chat box. Uh, <laughs> but the culture it really really helps in effective activities to help dances or music for the language, music and the poems, and all sorts. Uh, but but yeah, that's 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 part of my oh, support you, around it. <laughs> thank you so much. Now, Tracy, I've got a really curly question for you. Hey, but I know it's something that you work with your students on, so I'm okay. tossing you this one, mm -hmm. and that's the idea that um, for people who come from the Pakeha culture. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, we often don't think about that as being a, a culture. We, we, you know, we take things for granted, but I know that is something that you work on with your students about that idea of what culture really might actually mean and how we can use it when we're working with people. Yeah. Do you know, I think a lot of what we're finding is um, at the moment is we're thinking about culture, because I struggle with it as well. I think being a Kiwi born, not really travelled, um, I, I'm stuck sometimes with understanding what my culture is but the more and more I'm looking into it I think a lot of it can sit around what is our values and principles about the way that we actually want and need to do things so what drives us and what's important to us as an individual and it can be those things as well as how much you want to spend with people how little you want to speak, spend with people is your whānau the most important thing your pets really important so what are not just your interests but your values and principles that you hold up must in your life and that tends to sit alongside what our culture actually looks like so um the other thing is is i think and, and coming into an encompassing culture in general is what are the rituals that you actually do that helps you ease into the day or ease into the night. So it's those practices and rituals that we actually do. And they don't have to be of a religious nature. But for example, I remember one group was really unsettled. So we looked in some of the, um, one of the facilities that we were supporting and there were ructions around three o'clock in the afternoon. And it was often around the change of staff occurring. There's a lot of people, a lot of noise. But what they brought in was they realized with that group of people that they often had a wee special tipple about that time that also was preparing them for the afternoon afternoon so they brought that ritual into the rest home space so they got a little drinks trolley and they had like proper beautiful glasses and they were actually drinking lemonade and all of that no, I don't think anyone was getting too drunk but um, it was more of the ritual of what they were doing as preparatory work in regards to that so I think there are if we think about culture from the perspective of what is your underlying values and principles, I think that actually does help us. Yeah. That's 
Fantastic. Thank you so much, Tracy. And, you know, being aware of that stops us from thinking that that's just the way the world is. That's right. We, yes, we it actually does. reflect that that is something that we all, yeah. all yeah. different. And from. having those conversations is lovely, but you can see it through family. You can... You can, you can actually see it through so many different things, how a person dresses, how a person presents themselves, how they like to be addressed. There are so many different ways and and um, and expressions on how we actually, you know, we, whether we go and do a wash, wash ourselves up before having a meal, whether we have um, a prayer before a meal, you know, what do we do? Who sits where? All of those things is actually part of uh, who we are and what we are. And I'd just like to say to our Pacific Island um, group, I love that concept. Language is so, so important, particularly for our people um, that are living with a dementia. They will go back to their natural language. And that's so hard for us who can only speak the Kiwi, um, that having that ability, but it's familiarity as well, like I see. And I don't know whether it's an actual flower you've got in your hair or whether it's just part of the computer, but um, it's just beautiful. But I those are the things that make people feel they've got a connection, you know, so I just love to know, because we have very few Pacific Island um, facilities down here in Christchurch, and it's just lovely to know that we've got that, um, uh, you know, um, developing, because there's nothing like being able to be open and more expressive to somebody that seems and feels familiar to you. So it's really nice that we've got that. And one thing, sorry, Susan, is I got very excited when I was watching some people that were doing some work on the marais. And it's about holding, what are the roles that people usually hold mm -hmm. when they're in the marais? And I remember a case study of a chap, an older Māori man that actually was waving his walking stick around and staff felt, felt that he was being threatening. But actually, they found out that he was one of the big speakers on the marae. And in actual fact, that's what he was doing. It was just the time of the day where he was having his talk and he was trying to welcome people and, and express himself. So once they realised that, they thought, oh, it's not a threat at all. So it's just understanding, I think, what are people's roles Fantastic. And Orcadia, would you like to have um, a last word before we, we head across to to Daryl about, you know, that, that thing about one of the things about meaning is connecting in with the life we've lived, the values that we have, you know, what makes us as a person? Yes, look, uh, uh, two points. One for the Pacifica, um, for the Pacifica Fano today, uh, there is a trust based in Wellington, uh, they are named Project Village. Uh, we have done some work with them and they do have funding now. They provide well-being bags for Pacifica families at no cost and diversional and recreational therapy consultancy also for free. So it will be worth it to connect you with them um, because it seems to me that sometimes we, we, we do, we're doing a lot of things it's just about connecting with each other. So I would be more than happy to connect you with them. They do a lot of work in that space, particularly dementia and Pacifica families. Um, and the second one about meaning, I think it's just going back to the fundamental principle of uh, humanness. So just get to know the person, okay? Um, and, and then everything just will automatically fall into place. Sometimes we put a lot of pressure in ourselves on on trying to have a structure or trying to have um, something specific, like, okay, it's important to understand people's life story. But if you know something basic, like I introduce myself to all of you who don't know me with a basic pepeja. By doing that, you already know that I was born in Mexico, therefore I will speak Spanish. So when I grow old, if I happen to develop dementia, if I happen to go back to speaking Spanish, and if you know that I am someone that appreciates um, a hug or a kiss on the cheek, that will make me happy. So I think if you just go to the basics of what's important for that person, acknowledging who they have been, acknowledging who they are at this point in time, validating the human in front of you and preparing for what is yet to come, you already have the answers and you will know how to do it. And um, I, I, I thank you so much for starting with the poem today, Susan, because I do love poetry, particularly 
romanticism, Spanish poetry. We 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 love that. Um, and if you have a loved one who is unable to verbalize any longer what they want, but if you know they used to love poetry, just read it to them. That's what I do on the phone with my nana. Um, if um, if you know that there is a, a specific song, it doesn't have to be complicated. It can be quite simple. It's just that sometimes we overthink it. Uh, just go back to the basics. We're humans. <laughs> it's all about connections. 